Thank you for the introduction. Good morning. It's a pleasure to um, be here and talk um, about the disruptive potentials of digital and computation technologies in architecture today. And I think what we have to remind us is that um, the disruptive potential is something that we should uh, seize in the construction industry because um, we're facing serious challenges, um, environmental challenges. If we remind ourselves that building industry is responsible for 40% of energy and resource consumption on the planet, um, productivity challenges, when we remind ourselves that productivity is stagnating in the building industry since the 1960s, and social and political challenges because of the lack of productivity, even in a country like Germany, the building industry is not able to satisfy the demands um, actually even just by half of what is required in, for example, inner city um, new construction. So um, I think what we really need to do is we need to somewhat fundamentally uh, rethink design and construction, and I think digital technologies allow us to do so. Um, at the University of Stuttgart, we have a team of about 22 um, full-time researchers, some of them architects, some of them engineers, some of them computer scientists, and we collaborate on this idea of rethinking design and construction, um, and that mainly revolves around a higher level of integration. And that's also why this is the uh, title of my talk, because I think what we see in the in building industry is a lack of innovation, a lack of groundbreaking innovation, because the building industry is incremental, so all the research development take that takes place is incremental. I remind you of the stunning image that you saw before of the robot laying brickwork. That sounds futuristic to start off with, but if you really think of it, is that such a great idea? A robot, basically, that automates a, a kind of essentially pre-digital building system, which is the brick. The brick has been around for 2,000 years and has been designed to be laid by a man, and the size of the brick is defined by the weight that a kind of bricklayer can handle day in, day out. Um, it is a construction material that is incredibly energy intensive because it needs to be burned at several hundred degrees. Um, so what we very tend to do is we look at the automation on the one hand and we use high-end technology for that, but we don't look at the building system which remains to be pre-digital. Um, same can probably be said for the planning process where we saw a fantastic talk now about how the digital uh, potentials can be utilized in the planning, in the facility management, even in the end of life cycle uh, management. But really, um, what BIM at this moment anticipates is a conventional construction process. And I think this is actually really um, the industry 4.0 paradigm, and this will be the impact of it in the building industry. A robot that lays bricks is actually a mere automation of a previously manual process that is actually strictly under the definition of the four industrial revolutions, industry 3.0. Um, but I think that's, it's interesting. It's, it's a kind of interesting showcase of how in the building industry we actually struggle with some of these terms. But I think one thing that is for sure is that um, with industry 4.0, we shift towards a paradigm where we have process unspecific machinery. That is the interesting aspect about the robot. And that's what you can see here on the right. The robot in a car manufacturing plant actually does everything. It welds the body shell, it measures the body shell, it does the quantity insurance, the quality insurance, it manhandles the parts, it glues in the windscreen. It's a kind of universal machine that is adapted to specific tasks. Very different than we usually think about digital machinery, which is usually the kind of um, computerized equivalent of something that existed before. Um, the consequence of that is that we have production processes that can actually produce variable products without any costs um, or additional production complexity. Now that has a fundamental consequence um, for the building sector. And because in the building sector, we used to always think about the economy of me, sort of the economy of scales as something that relies on the repetition of the same part as often as possible, which is really the consequence of um, the 
the kind of first industrial revolution. Now, what we do is, in tr trying to actually um, develop this higher level of integration, we look at a world in which integration of how things are made and how things are designed is always inherently there already. And that is not something that we can find in the history of technology, that's actually something that we can find in nature. In nature, um, you always have an incredible high level of integration of the systems that are generated and the processes is how things are built. Um, it's also, that's one of my favorite quotes. Um, in biology, material is expensive, but shape is cheap. And that means material is expensive for an organism to produce. It takes a lot of energy, metabolic energy, um, but it can actually be freely formed. Um, as of today, the opposite was true in the case of technology. Now, arguably, if we really take robotic fabrication serious, this no longer applies, and we can get a lot of shape, and as a consequence, we should be able to build with a lot less material. And I think, as I mentioned before, this is critical, because I think we're getting to grips with the operational energy of buildings, but the primary energy that goes into the material um, for construction is enormous. As I said before, we consume 40% of the resources on the planet for construction, and by that we generate 50% of the waste. Once the day will come that this becomes a political focus, um, sort of consumption, the kind of resource consumption of the building industry, there will be um, possibly drastic measures to which we need to adjust. Um, so I will show you two examples of how we imagine this can be changed. Um, these are experimental buildings, by no means have the complexity of a hospital, that needs to be set. Um, but I think it is, requires a bit of depth and that's why I decided to just show two examples to understand where these kind of different levels of innovation may take place. One is an example um, of how we can actually build like this Today, it's actually a building that we completed in 2014 with conventional building materials. Um, and the other one is an indication of how we may actually be able to build tomorrow um, utilizing new construction materials, in this case carbon fiber, and uh, totally new manufacturing processes, which I will showcase on a um, building that we finished in 2000, last year. So let me start with the first one, which was um, uh, a kind of exhibition hall um, that was the final outcome of an EU-funded project on robotic manufacturing in the timber, timber industry. Um, this is a fully functional building, um, permanent building, um, equipped with uh, all the facilities that, that you need, um, yet constructed in a totally different way. Um, it's interesting to see that Arguably, one of the oldest construction materials that we have, which is wood, is still really the only fully sustainable building material that is at our disposal. Um, wood is naturally renewable, fully recyclable, has even a negative footprint. That is a kind of unique characteristic of that building material and a very low level of embodied energy. So it's an, a material with unrivaled environmental virtues, and it will remain like that. Um, it's also, at least in the south of Germany, where this project took place, the only regionally available resource. So um, in Germany, 30, 31% of the land is actually still forest. Um, so it's really a potential to tap into something that is readily available right next to where you built. And then finally, wood has remarkable mechanical properties, so it can really become a high-tech construction system, which is obviously interesting if you work in that part of Germany, because that is a high-tech region, so it's really about the synthesis of how can one of the most advanced manufacturing industry in the world meet this very old construction material and really bring the two together um, to create uh, innovation. And the innovation, um, is more or less seen here. That's a building system that we developed, which is basically a plate system. So you have a wood plate, and you take the ability of the robot to machine that wood plate in a very precise way so that you can actually fit it together without the need for any adhesives, 
any screws, any bolts, any metal. The whole intelligence of the joint is embedded in the piece itself and is actually intelligent because it disappears. Um, so you can imagine if you put this, this is the load bearing structure. This is not sort of an interior fit out. Um, and you can imagine if you want to do this, a kind of three dimensional puzzle um, as the load bearing structure of a, a building of a considerable size, um, that brings up several challenges. One of the challenges is, um, and that's what the engineers brought up immediately, is that if you imagine you have these joints, they're very good in transferring the forces that act on the building um, in shear forces. So if the, the, the blade wants to move this way, it's basically held in place by the joint. If there are bending forces, it's actually pretty weak because there's a, it's almost like a pivot. If there are tension forces, it's of no use whatsoever. So the engineers had the initial inclination to say, sounds like a good academic idea. It's of no use whatsoever um, in the building industry. That's when it's interesting to begin to look into biology as an alternative source um, for uh, design principles. Because what we can find, or what we did find, when we talked to biologists at the University of Tübingen, specialists in biomechanics and evolutionary structures, um, is that there are natural systems that do exactly this, that consists out of individual blades. This is actually sand dollar, a kind of sea urchin, and you can see that it is made from blades. It has a blade skeleton. That's a load-bearing structure of the animal. And if we zoom in a little bit at this connection, it's actually held together by the biological equivalent of our timber joints. So in consequence, that means that that animal has found a way to fully capitalize on the possibilities of that joint to actually construct a load-bearing system. So that's what we try to understand. We worked for more than a year with the biologists. We figured out what the so-called biomedic design principles are that allow us to build in this way a fully stable structure. Um, and then we started to uh, also consider how we can implement that in a design process. Um, so obviously, this is something that you cannot draw. This is something that you cannot model. This is something that you cannot parametrically generate. You need a different design method for this. Um, and that's what we developed, where we actually consider each blade as an individual entity that it knows how it needs to comply with these biological construction principles. The blade knows about the, con the geometric constraints that it obviously needs to be planar because it's made from a timber plate. Um, it knows about the constraints of the robotic fabrication process, which can be fully simulated before. It knows about all the regulations and building code compliance rules um, that are important if you distribute ten thousands of joints that all need to comply with current building regulations. And in the end, it directly communicates with the robot as the machine. So all that is embedded in one design tool that you can see here. So the blades move around, and each blade, in interaction with its neighboring blades, tries to find a place where all these complex situations are satisfied. So I think this is interesting because it shows two things. If you can repeat that, well, never mind. Um, can go to the next slide. Um, what is interesting is that is also a new way of man-machine interaction. I can actually go in and say, I don't want to have this plate here. I want to have it over here. And then the whole model adjusts in real time. At the same time, we have now extended that so we have real-time fabrication parameters. At any moment in time that the model is running and I can interact with it, I know about the stock size, I know about the length of the machine path, I know about the fabrication costs, I know about the connection angles, which tells me about the fabrication complexity, and I have a real-time life cycle analysis model running in the background, and we're just working on embedding also a life cycle costing model that runs in the background. So you're aware of all these complexities that are usually very difficult to comprehend as an architect. And you can actually focus on what you're probably best at, and that is designing the building. Um, in this case, we built with uh, a new kind of building product. It's timber, old stuff. But uh, in the last 
100 years um, in Central Europe, we have focused on building with uh, softwoods in Switzerland, Germany, Austria. Um, because of the climate change, softwood forests will slowly disappear. We will have a lot of hardwood, um, but at the moment we don't really know what to do with these hardwoods. Um, only 9% of hardwood is used in the building industry, 50% is used as firewood. It's one of the best regional resources we have, and the only thing that comes to mind is burn it. Um, it's interesting, if you look at it, beach plywood has actually 25% better uh, mechanical properties than our regular construction woods. Um, but it also has a challenge, and that is that, as you may know, uh, hardwoods have the tendency to react with moisture more dramatically, so they tend to deform. Um, so this is a bit of a challenge if you work with uh, very, very complex geometries that need to fit down to the millimeter. Um, in this case, what we did is we produce, we, tap our, we basically tap into the regular digital workflow of a timber manufacturer. This is a machine that any big timber manufacturer has already. It's a speed panel cutter. It produces hundreds of these. Um, one of the blades takes about two minutes to machine. And only the really important part is done by the robot, and that's machining the intricate joint. Um, and that's not, that is possible with the robot because the robot does not simply follow an instruction, go from A to B, cut that joint to a given geometry, but the robot knows what it needs to do and then compensates for deviations in real time. And this is how we are able to actually, and it doesn't only do the machining, it also does the drilling, it does all that, sorry. It does all that. Um, and it does that with, sorry. It does that with an kind of incredible high precision. So we have tolerances of 0.5 millimeters, whereas in the construction industry, more something on the centimeter range is typical. Um, we monitor that throughout the entire life cycle to see how um, the kind of distort, sort of the warping of the panels may affect the stability of the building. But at the, at the moment, it's more that it keeps on locking the system rather than compromising the stability. Um, and then um, the whole building is actually assembled like a three-dimensional puzzle. Um, the timber craftsmen that are crucial for that process still uh, don't need to bring any equipment to the site. Um, and all parts of the building are actually digitally manufactured, including the insulation panels. This is the insulation also made from lo local wood, uh, wood fiber boards, and the um, water cladding, all the parts that you need in order to construct a proper building. Um, in the end, um, the pre-manufacturing of the, the entire building took about three weeks, and it was set up on site um, in eight days, um, fully prefabricated. On the outside, on the outside, there is uh, timber cladding, so this is obviously not the load bearing structure, this is just the facade. But on the inside, what you see is actually what does the work. Um, that is the load bearing structure. Um, all these panels actually work as the structure of the system. Um, I think it's an interesting uh, example because it shows that um, those higher levels of integration allow you to achieve something that is, on the one hand, architecturally interesting, but it's on the other hand also incredibly um, effective. Um, you have to imagine that what you have here is basically a kind of raw construction. There's no other pieces required. And that means that you can build the entire structure um, which contains 605 cubic meters of space with just 12 cubic meters of wood. Now, if I tell you that one cubic meter of this kind of wood costs between 600 and 800 euros, you also know that this is a very cheap building. Um, and that is possible because the construction principles that we borrow from nature actually lead to a very, very high performance building. Um, in fact, if you really look at it um, and you look at the span of the building um, and you look at the kind of thickness of material, the amount of material that you need, you realize that our timber shell is half the thickness of an eggshell proportionally. So it is pretty high performance structure. And then one last point um, that is also increasingly important, um, 
all the material that we actually used for that timber shell was sourced within a 200 kilometer radius. All the wood came from actually local resources and all the know-how was added in a 100 kilometer radius, which makes politicians incredibly happy because they know that the whole value chain remains to be regional. Um, because I don't want to make it too boring, I have a fancy video to also wake those of you up who are beginning to fall asleep with some heroic music that summarizes that process better than I can. So all the trees that we use for that building are cut on site. By the way, this is the first building that was where the primary structure was robotically fabricated in the world. So I think this is an example of how, with regular construction materials that are available today, and we can build buildings like this that comply with all the regulations, comply with all the standards, um, that can be delivered on shorter, shorter timescales and lower budgets than how we build today. Um, when we begin to really think about these things in an integrative fashion. The second example I wanted to show you um, looks at sort of the opposite side of the spectrum if you think about materials. Wood, as I said, is arguably one of the oldest. So what happens if you really tap into the reservoir of advanced high-tech materials that are available in other industries? This is something that we investigated um, with this structure that we completed last year for the Victorian Albert Museum in London, um, which is entirely made from carbon fiber. As I mentioned, the most versatile constructions of fiber materials we find in nature. One that we have been investigating for a while is this incredibly high performance shell of flying beetles. Um, this is a structure that is made from chitin fibers that are embedded in a protein matrix. Um, so instead of resin, it uses protein and instead of carbon fiber, it uses chitin. Um, and that structure um, is there to protect the flying beetle, the flying wing of the beetles. Um, in ground beetles that just crawl on the ground, this is a solid slab of material. This is a microscopic section of that thing. Um, but in flying beetles, it's an incredibly lightweight, high-performance shell um, that has unmatched 
efficiency. Um, so for that, we also use new digital technologies, handy tools like this particle accelerator that our colleagues in Karlsruhe have. And with that huge machine, which has a 40 meter diameter, you can actually build a computational model of the forewing of the beetle um, with a resolution of three micron. So the computational paradigm also extends downscale and we can understand things that were five years ago impossible to understand. Again, for that, we always work with biologists um, who actually allow us to really understand what is going on here, but it's enabled by the communication that happens through computation. Um, we need to zoom in a little bit further to understand how the beetle kind of uses this incredible construction system. A construction system can do many things. Here you have a shell that spans between two support points. Here you have a shell that rests on a wall with a big cantilever. In building construction, we would use totally different systems in order to enable that. Nature all does it with one system with unmatched um, performance. And the secret of the performance revealed, if we zoom further in, and we see that what appears as a double layered shell is actually one system. It's not how we would deal with it in construction. In construction, we build upper surface, lower surface, put some sticks in between. Nature all builds it with one continuous fiber system where all the fibers you can nicely see here are continuous between the upper and the lower surface. And that results in this unmatched performance. That's something that we took as the kind of primary principle for developing a building system where we have um, a scaffold of glass fiber onto which we lay carbon fiber and all the fibers connect between the upper and the lower surface. We use the material itself to form an embedded mold. So we have a robot and the robot lays the fibers on a very simple steel scaffold. And the scaffold can in the end be taken out and reused. Um, but what really creates the shape of the component the intricate shape is the fiber itself. That's something you can see here. These are the elements that we built for the Victorian Art Museum in our lab. This is something that we still produced ourselves. Um, there's a direct interrelation between design and manufacturing. This is the glass fiber that starts off like a soft filament. You just saw how that is saturated with resin and then the robot applies it on that rotating frame. Um, and then the robot initially applies the glass fiber, as you can see here, that generates the shape, that becomes the embedded mold onto which then the black carbon fiber, as you can see here, is laid, because this is an incredibly expensive material. It's only laid exactly where you need it and how much you need it. Um, and with that, once the resin hardens, you get actually an incredibly strong building element. Then you can actually collapse the steel scaffold um, you put it in an oven to actually accelerate the curing a little bit. <clears throat> and you take the steel scaffold out, you use it for the next element, um, and you have those um, fiber composite building elements. With the same tool, we can also build the columns that hold the, the roof up. Um, it's just a minor modification of one end of the scaffold. Um, what is interesting is that with one process, with one tool, they can build an infinite amount of um, elements. Um, so the fiber lay, the carbon fiber amount and orientation in exactly the same way as the beetle does is always exactly tuned to what is required to form a stable structure. Um, that means every element is different. Every element responds to the loads it uh, kind of receives. And that again means that we have materials that are very, very lightweight. Actually, one element that is about five square meters weighs less than 50 kilograms. That brings up another interesting aspect of that prototype, which is that um, if you imagine that your entire manufacturing plant fits in a tiny tent, all you need to build this 200 something square meter roof is a little robot and a rotating scaffold, you can actually think of extending the building site towards the kind of use time of the building. And that's exactly what we did. The VNA allowed us to keep the robots in the courtyard. And while the roof, the canopy was already used, we kept on building additional elements 
as a kind of local production because you just need to show up with one kilogram of carbon fiber, small bucket of resin, and you can build everything. Why this is interesting is that because that allows us to overcome one of the biggest issues that we have in the building industry, and that is that sometimes the way we build the spaces we allocate to certain functions and programs is obsolete once it's done. So here, we have the ability to build a dynamic space and an evolving structure that can adapt over time, that can reconfigure where parts can be taken away, parts that can be added. And the interesting question is obviously what drives that change? What drives the reconfiguration of that canopy that changed many times during the run um, of last summer? Uh, and what we really did is what we wanted to investigate is how people um, interact with this pavilion space. Um, so we measured, we had the whole, the whole roof was equipped with sensors that measure how people navigate through the space, where they spend time, um, how long they are in certain locations. At the same time, the roof was equipped with environmental sensors, so we measure temperature, everything, so we can compute a thermal climate index, universal thermal climate index. And by that, we can actually begin to read correlations between what spaces are occupied, what are the preferable locations, what parts need to be extended, what other parts can contract. And the whole building becomes like a learning system where we create a big data set that we can keep on yielding, uh, keep on reading out and understand the patterns, the complex patterns of behavior of how people interact with these spaces without the need to have clear predictions at the onset, but by using machine learning, we can actually begin to understand what these interactions and all their subtlety really are. Um, so in the end, I think it's important to recapitalize that the whole structure, everything that you see here is only made from these kind of fiber materials. There's no steel, nothing, just fibers. That the whole roof, which has about 225 square meters, um, weighs less than two thousand kilograms. So 200 square meters of roof area where less than, weigh less than two square meters of V&A brick wall. And again, if I tell you that one ton of carbon fiber is horribly expensive, but horribly expensive means 10,000 euros per ton. You add another 10,000 euros for the resin and you know what the material costs for the building. Um, if you also know that the carbon fiber is produced, the carbon fiber reused is produced using only water energy, so that all the embedded energy in the carbon fiber that is quite huge is actually renewable energy. So it really begins to shift our understanding of even working with these kinds of materials in an integrative way allows you um, to build and think structures that are basically very difficult to design um, to conceive and to construct if we just always think of innovation as an incremental improvement of existing of processes that we already know. Thank you very much. Thank you.